Wow. Well, thank you, thank you for today, and that was an amazing presentation to follow. Uh, I'd really like to talk about the happiness in technology and how we can amplify those significantly. Um, and change the lifeblood of our economy from oil to ingenuity. Here is a quote from Thomas Edison in 1910. He begins this quote with, it looks like to him sunshine and energy are a lot the same. They're both spread out very thin, and what he had to do with electricity is accumulated up enough so that, as he said, it would light a bunch of little lights. And he goes on to say that at some point in time, we must surely gather all the energy we need from local sources and store this in unlimited quantities in our own communities, and electricity ought to be as cheap as oxygen. Okay? What I'd like to talk today about is, and share with you guys, is the things that we've learned in the last 12 years of trying to do some of this. It's been a rather interesting uphill battle. And what we found out, let me ask a question. How many of you know about peak oil? Okay, how many of you think peak oil is going to be an absolute disaster in the next three years? Okay, how many think climate change needs to be solved within the next 10 years? Okay, what I want to do is when we go through this today, I want to convince you or at least solicit from you the idea that we solve this by 2020, that we operate within a solar budget by 2020. Where we got in infrastructure trouble was in the mobilization to fight World War I. That's when we monopolized communications under AT&T and we socialized power and transportation infrastructure as natural monopolies. That was the term they used at the time. And so at that point in time, we stopped having a free market where we fully burden a gallon of gas with the true cost of defending the oil supply chains and of the consuming of the resources. So we dislocated what we do best in America, voting with our pocketbook, from our normal daily behavior. So we ended up with a century of rotary telephones. Power, power infrastructure has not changed significantly. And we still have the gas mileage of a Model T. <laughs> OK, that's really true. We still have exactly the same gas mileage as a Model T. And that worked out OK for us in the beginning of time, up until about 1970, when US domestic oil production kept increasing. But oil fields all have exactly the same characteristic, where you start out, you tap into them, you, ex you extract a bunch of stuff, and then you hit a peak, and then it declines. And we hit that peak in 1970 in the US. By the way, that peak was forecast by Dr. Hubbard in 1956, in what's called the Hubbard Peak or Peak Oil. And everybody said, oh, that can't possibly happen. And geology is slow, but it is un unbelievably relenting and unforgiving. It will impact, and it will impact on its schedule. So what we had to do is we had to start importing oil. And this is where we got more and more in trouble. So 1973 oil embargo hit us pretty hard. 1980, the Iran uh, revolution hit us hard. And right now, we're being hit rather significantly by oil, and I'll talk more about that. But here is a very correlation between imported oil and national debt. So Governor Huntsman, in the last Republican debate, was the first political leader I have heard say this yet. But in that debate, he said, the price, the true burden price of a gallon of gas is $13 a gallon. And that really is true. And I think it actually is more than that, because from my perspective, I don't mind using anything, but we ought to restore any natural resource we use to like condition for our posterity. In other words, we're not just in this for ourselves. We're in this for, um, I'm highly in, I was educated at West Point, and I'm really oriented around um, military thinking about the need to defend the Constitution, and we have a duty to that be, is beyond ourselves. And the Constitution lays out the, in the preamble that we're responsible for liberty for ourselves and our posterity. 
when we are hollowing out the earth and giving our children a world depleted of resources and responsibility to solve it, we're not being very ethical. So debt is a, is a tax on future labor. So debt beyond our ability to pay off on our time is a tax on the labor and liberty of children. And we really need to get this under control. And the easiest way to do that is to become self-reliant. If we're self-reliant, we don't need oil, imported oil. It'll be rigorous. It won't be easy. But it will be incredibly rewarding. Um, when it, uh, Teresa was talking about meaningful work and progress. When we become self-reliant, it will be unbelievably uh, rewarding internally to ourselves. So remember this U.S. peak oil curve. When you add up all the oil in the world, we hit peak oil in 2005 at 74 million barrels a day. All right. In the past, the economy has always grown relative to oil supply growth since, we, since central planning made oil the lifeblood of our economies in the 50s. Okay, it was really post-World War II that we adopted the car culture. Because if you look at this curve, this is a 200-year curve of oil use. All right? Before 1950, we didn't use very much. While I have been alive, I was born in 1950, about 80% of all the oil that's ever been used in history, human history has been used while I've been alive. And when people say there's plenty of oil left, absolutely true. Okay, peak oil is not about running out of oil. It's about running out of affordable oil. So when you tap in the net energy, you're going to see that we are going to lose about 90% of what we are used to having in affordable oil in the next 20 years. So we have one of two choices. We will become incredibly innovative and decrease energy per passenger mile by 85%, or nature will decrease the number of passengers by 85%. I'm, I'm working for the first one. <laughs> All right, this goes back to happiness. It'd be a lot happier to, to be able to get around without having to have oil. And the a most amazing thing is we actually can do this. All right, so here is another part of that quote from Edison in that same 1910 uh, discussion talking about, do we use coal and or sun and wind? He says, oh no, we burn coal and wood like squatter, or like renters burn the front fence. We live like squatters, not like we own the property. So I think that we are, my hope is, is that we will embrace this obligation to look at both for ourselves and our posterity as an obligation and begin work immediately with the idea that we operate within a solar budget by 2020. If you make it any longer than that, we won't do it. We'll find reasons and excuses. This will be rigorous. Now, I, I had the great fortune of spending three years as an Arctic light infantryman and in Alaska. And if you've ever, how many of you have ever been on a glacier? Okay, they are spectacular. They're huge. It's very humbling. And they are almost alive, but they're moving so slow. But within my lifetime, in the time that I have spent in the Arctic, glaciers are running back up in the valleys like rabbits. Nothing moves on this Titanic uh, that is this big and this significant at this rate unless there are absolutely Titanic forces being applied to it. So when we look at that mess of the tar sands in Alberta, which I think is a worse ecological disaster than the BP oil spill, what we are doing in the Arctic, look at this picture of the ice cap. And then this is 1979. This is, 19, this is 2003. I couldn't find 2007. It's even worse. And the thinning of it is spectacular. And ice has different characteristics. Old ice is blue, and it's hard and compressed. Green ice has lots of salt water in it, and it's more unstable. The rate at which we are affecting the polar cap is bizarre. And I don't know how climate works, how climate change works. I do know that nature has a balance to it. And if you disrupt that balance, you have consequences beyond our reckoning. So we would be better off to be conservative and not add 
to unsequester carbon that's been sequestered for millions of years to our happy consequence and live within a solar budget. Now, Dr. Duncan in 1984 laid out this curve, it's called the Old Levi Gorge, noting that the Mayans are going to be right in 2012. <laughs> Actually, though, when you count it, starting in about 1990, and I've been to Iraq, and I, have, I think that we're doing a pretty good job for the most part, but we started endless oil wars. Well, they might not be endless. They'll be ended when we end our addiction to oil. All right? And I, but we need to account for those costs in a gallon of gas so that we pay for it. We're a capitalist country. If we have to pay for it, we will judge things more rationally. And that's the previous little video that you saw. When companies start having to account for costs, they change behavior. And in the 1970 Clean Air, Clean Water Act, I was in industry at the time. There was wailing and gnashing of teeth that this was going to be horrible for us. But what we found out is profit is the difference between the value customers willingly pay and the cost to compete. When we couldn't throw waste out into the, so when we couldn't socialize waste by dumping it into a river, we had to account for it. All of a sudden, we cleaned up our processes and we used a lot fewer resources to make the same value. Companies actually became more profitable. The same thing will happen when we account the true cost of using oil when we desocialize those and capitalize the cost back in. We probably won't do it, but if we start talking about it and everybody recognizes gas is $13 a gallon, that will make a difference. So 2005, or 2002, gas was $1.45 a gallon. By 2006, it had climbed to $2.92 a gallon. That difference took about $2,000 out of the average working class family's budget, disposable income. That forced more and more families to choose between paying for their commute and paying for their mortgages, so foreclosures climbed. Then in 2008, the banking system collapsed. So in reality, this curve, we are ahead of this curve. <laughs> he was optimistic. Now, I'm going to come back to this because I don't think we have an energy problem, nor do I think we have a disaster problem. We are going back to the energy per capita my parents had that did just fine with. Okay, but they were tools for it. And I want to show you some tools. All right, we know we can implement radical changes in, in technology or in infrastructure. We went from, in 1984, we demonopolized AT&T and threw it back into a free market. Central planners, when people are competing for central planners, they strive for consistency. When people have to sell things to a free market, they have to differentiate themselves by either better service, lower cost, or innovation. So it creates a niche for innovation to happen. And the result was we had a 10x change. And it takes 10x. It takes 10 times better to make a paradigm shift. We have seen this in transportation before. In 1865, a ticket from New York to San Francisco cost $1,000. And that was $1,000 in 1865 dollars, which are real dollars. Um, in 1869, just four years later, despite the complexities of the Civil War, it cost $67. We built the trans, the trans -Continental railroads were built. All right? That was a 15x change. That set up for railroads to be the catalyst for the Industrial Revolution and for changing energy systems from biofuel, hay and wood. And we don't, and I, I don't know if anybody think about biofuel and ethanol, but I don't want to go back to a biofuel society. We already know what that looks like. It looks agrarian, okay? They changed the energy system from biofuels to fossil fuels. So we are now facing an incredible choice of what do we do? And people say, we can't do anything. We have to cling to what we have, and we don't. What I'd like to do is show you what we've come up with over the last while and say that this is just the beginning of what is possible. So here is, and I don't know if it's playing or not. This is J-Pods. These are ultralight, so they weigh 500 pounds. You get in one, you tell the computer where you want to go, it lifts you up to the rail and takes you there at one-tenth the energy of cars, trains, and buses. 
Okay, and trains and buses, passenger trains use the same energy per passenger mile as a car, basically. And this is a picture of the first one we built in my garage. And there is all the technology to do this stuck in garages all over the place. And here is an example of what this would look like over a highway. And the reason to suspend this is when we hang the, rail, the vehicle below it, we take out the parasitic mass, the mass of the suspension system. And that's how we get these very light. And then it makes the space over the top of the rail a natural place to put collection systems. So we gather five to 30,000 vehicle miles of power per mile of rail per day. So we actually can power urban transportation within a solar budget. It costs you 56 cents a mile to operate your car. It costs four cents a mile to operate these. That's a 14x change. We create a massive demand for solar collectors a stable market. So how many have heard the, the solar manufacturers going bankrupt in the US lately? OK, that's because we're treating them as standalone devices, just like we treated personal computers before 1984. Then once we started networking, Apple came out with Apple Talk, and then, TOC, and then um, TCP IP, internet, uh, it exploded. Because we don't like, standalone devices are useful, but not spectacular. Now, one of the things that we've learned at this is here's what we built for solar over the top of, we can't cross a road, all right? We can't get permission from government agencies to build these over city streets. So here's the solar collectors designed by Swenson Solar for deployment over J-Pod rails. This is at Plantronics headquarters in California. And they're pretty cu cute. One of the things that we have learned about this aspect of solar and the core part of our group studied nuke engineering together, is that we're treating solar like it's little nuke or coal plants. We need to treat them like they're leaves on a tree. And one of the things I wanted to show you is how scalable the storage and distribution systems are. So here's one I carry around. We set this out in the sun. It separates. We don't need to extract metals. We can operate right here. So this collects it, electrolyzes it, this drives this motor, it's really cute. And here's a light, a personal energy server, so moms and kids can read. And this is actually lights a room. And we'll put a solar collector, or I mean a cell phone charger on it, so that it will also charge cell phones on the next one. So the things that we can do is we can plant gardens. Self-reliance is the solution to this. So plant a garden, start looking at personal energy, start looking at opening markets to transportation, and accounting for truly capitalizing the cost of existing energy. Thank you very much for your time.